praying. I, I don't know where y'all pray. I mean, I, I mean, it says to pray without ceasing. I was praying in the shower, and I said, Lord, I've got this dream, and I've, I don't yet have the full interpretation on it. I've shared it with probably eight people, and only one or two have tried to interpret it. The others simply said, that's an interesting dream. And no one that has really given me a satisfactory interpretation of my dream. And this morning I said, Lord, would you lead me to someone today that would help to interpret my dream? That's what, that was my prayer. And during the break, would you know that God would bring one of the students here to me that would say, I've been studying dream interpretation. And I think that, the, first of all, she has a word for me, which is written down, I haven't read yet. And that maybe you need this book on understanding the dreams you dream. And I've been studying it. And uh, I said, I have a dream. Would you help me to interpret it? And tomorrow we're going to meet. She's going to help me interpret my dream. Is that a quick answer to prayer or what? I mean, I, hallelujah for the way God does these things. When you get prompted by the Holy Spirit to say something to somebody, don't you back off and not say it based on, oh, well, that probably wasn't God or whatever. Because uh, Natasha came to me. Where's Natasha? Natasha's my dream interpreter. Hallelujah. Here she is, right over here. She's going to interpret my dream. We're trusting God is going to give her wisdom. Thank you for listening to God and responding and bringing me the word and hallelujah the book so I can understand the dreams you dream. That's cool. I've been wanting this book too. And uh, I just have not gotten around to order in the book. So, man, I'm feeling happy right now. <laughs> Stepping into my destiny. All right, let's take our, well, let's see. Uh, let's put the next PowerPoint up. I, I'm not sure which one I went with. All right, go to the next slide and let's see where, where we're going here. Okay, one of the most powerful forces in the world is the tremendous army of business, professional, and governmental leaders who are anointed by God to serve Him on a daily basis in their own sphere of influence. I want to talk to you for a few minutes this morning about the anointing that God gives. So let's go to the next screen. We're going to have a verse of Scripture here. We're going to just walk through this verse of Scripture for a minute. This is 1 John chapter 2 verse 27 and for some reason or another it doesn't all fit on that screen but that's all right we'll be able to get the rest of the verse first john chapter 2 verse 27 you can open your bible to look at it or you can read it off the screen i want you to think about this with me for a minute the anointing is my definition the supernatural empowerment from god to allow you to do what you could not do within your natural strength. The anointing comes to you from God and it enables you to move beyond your natural ability into His supernatural ability. The anointing is this kind of intangible thing that becomes very tangible when it lands in your life. Now if you read this with me, I want you to read one, two, three, four, five, six words, and then stop. I want you to read it out loud. But the anointing which you have. Okay, let's just read that far. I want you to read that again. But the anointing which you have. Okay, just say that, those six words again. But the anointing which you have. Have is a possessive word, and it's a present tense word. So when you see the word have, you know it's something that's going on right now, and you know it's something that I have myself. It's, it's possessive, present tense. So it says here that this anointing, this kind of intangible and yet tangible when it becomes real in my life, this thing called the anointing is something that I have. Now I want you to tell somebody next to you, I have an anointing. Now, usually in church settings, we use the word anointing to refer to preaching or worship. That's the most common usage for it. And we use it in this way. Wasn't the worship anointed today? Or wasn't pastor anointed today? 
meaning didn't pastor move beyond his natural ability into the supernatural realm when he preached the word to us today? Hallelujah for the anointing on the preacher. If the anointing doesn't come on the preacher, we get real sleepy. Anybody ever fall asleep in a sermon? Hey, man, I've fallen asleep in a lot of, I've fallen asleep in anointed sermons. I mean, sometimes you just get so tired, you can't stay awake. I've never fallen asleep in my own sermon, which would re really be the, the worst of all. Would be to be so boring that I fell asleep while I was preaching. I mean, others have fallen asleep while I'm preaching. I have no problem with that. But I want to keep, at least keep myself awake. But when the anointing is there, you're much less likely to fall asleep. Do you agree with me? So we thank God for anointed preachers. Thank God for anointed worship. Sometimes worship is just music, just words and notes. But every once in a while in worship, we lift out of that natural realm into the supernatural. Do you know what I'm talking about, the anointing on worship? Now, I'm telling you that you have an anointing, and the anointing that you have does not relate itself only to preaching and worship. Okay, now I have an anointing, the Bible says, and it says the next word is received, so it means you, didn't, you weren't born with this. It's not natural abilities. It's not that which came to you, but it's a gift. It's, it's, you received it because God gave it to you. In fact, you know where you received it because it says there you received it from him. So it comes to you from God. So this morning when I say I have an anointing, I know that I have an anointing, and I know that I received the anointing, and I know I received it from God. So God has given to me an anointing. Do you believe that you have an anointing from God? How many of you believe that you have a specific anointing from God? Your anointing is different from my anointing. Mine is different from yours. When I'm in my anointing, I know it. When I'm not in my anointing, I also know it. Now it says here that the anointing that I've received from him abides, which means it's taken up residence in me. A number of years ago, I, I came out of a, a church background. God has just kind of led me through a long process of change in my ministry. I started off preaching in a, in a church, and I was trained in this background that you were only saved when you were baptized. That was my church background. Then I figured out Jesus saves you. And so when I got, man, I got into grace, it was like awesome, because I came out of works into grace. That was wonderful. And then I came out of, out of that into the mind, I was still in the mindset that the gifts of the Spirit were for yesterday and not for today. And then one day, God supernaturally ambushed me, threw me on the floor, and filled me with the Spirit against my theological understanding. God just had to do it to me. I mean, He totally did to me what I did not believe in. He did to me what I had preached against. And I'm laying on the floor thinking, suddenly when I realized what had happened, I thought, uh-oh. I wonder what my wife thinks. And when I finally could look, she was laying next to me thinking, I wonder what my husband thinks. Because God did it to us both, both at the same time. So we came back to our Bible church where we pastored, changed people. <laughs> I really changed people. Changed enough that we didn't have to say anything but the congregation knew that we were changed people. So we lived with that for a while, and then we started a new congregation. And in the new congregation, the Spirit of God showed up. I mean, we, we came out of one kind of background into this new kind of background. And I remember in our new congregation, it looked a lot like the old, except that God had changed everything. And so one night, our 6 o'clock service that was supposed to get out at 8.30 or 7.30 got out at midnight. I mean, just like the Spirit of God showed up, and we understood it was the anointing. I remember the first night that that happened. I remember parents dragging their kids out the back door of the church. 
I remember one 10-year-old was holding onto the door frame and dad saying, you've got to go home, but I don't want to leave church, daddy, please. I was like, the anointing of God was so strong that it was, there was a manifest presence of God that changed everything. So the next week, we had a guest to do a concert for us, and it was Alvin Slaughter. Anybody ever heard of Alvin Slaughter? Alvin can, I mean, Alvin can, well, I'll explain to you what Alvin can do by this next conversation I had with Alvin. So we're in the back room just getting ready to come out, and I said, now, Alvin, he said, yes, Pastor. I said, I'm really praying that the anointing shows up tonight, because I knew what happened last week. He said, oh, don't worry, I brought it with me. That's what this verse says. But the anointing that you receive from him abides in you. He said, oh, don't worry, I brought it with me. Now, when he said that, I thought, what's he talking about? I ran into Alvin about six months ago, and he and I were at the same place. I was preaching, he was doing music. And I told him that story. He said, yeah, that's something I would have said. Because he understands that he carries the anointing. He knows that when he stands up to sing about Jesus, that the anointing takes over. He knows that it's not just his good voice and good background, but that the anointing kicks in and takes it where it needs to go. So when he said, don't worry, I brought it with me, it taught me a theological truth. Hey, don't worry whether the anointing shows up when I'm there, because I brought it with me. Now, if you get that right, that means when you go to work, the anointing goes with you. See, it goes with you because it abides in you. So if it, if it abides in you, it means that wherever you go, it goes. So however it can show up here when we're worshiping, it can show up there when you're working at the computer. When you're, when you're in school and the anointing kicks in, it can kick in the same way when you're in retail sales. The anointing is in you, and it abides in you, so wherever you go, the anointing goes. You don't have to pray that the anointing shows up. You have to pray you show up. And the anointing comes with you. Man, I, all you got to do is be there. That's why in Afghanistan, without preaching, we can lead people to Jesus because we brought the anointing with us. I mean, the anointing was landing on what I was teaching, although it wasn't what I was I mean, it was what I'm teaching you. I'm teaching them destiny and purpose and joy and work and finding passion and all of those things, but I had to do it a totally different way. But at the end of the day, the anointing of God landed on it. Why? Because it came with me. And I want you to get into your mind that when you walk out of here, your anointing goes with you. You don't come to church to pick it up. You don't get into worship to find it. The only way it can kick in at worship is that you brought it to worship with you. You say, your worship leader, boy, was he anointed today. I tell you what, he wasn't anointed there if he wasn't anointed when he came in. He or she can't be anointed on the platform if they didn't have anointing in their hearts when they got there. It's got to be there. The pastor doesn't get anointed when he gets in the pulpit. He carries anointing to the pulpit with him. And it kicks in because it was already resident in his life. Now, the same thing is true with you. If I ask you this, how many of you have ever solved a problem without knowing how to solve it. Have you ever, have you ever been in a place where you, you had to solve a problem, but the manual didn't tell you, the training didn't, the, the, but all of a sudden, it came. That's the anointing. I want to tell you that is the anointing. The anointing kicks in when you have a problem, you don't know how to solve it. And so when, when, when you get on your job, there are a lot of things that you don't know how to do. Now, I know people that can interview better than they can work. And they can get great jobs. But I tell you what, getting a great job isn't the key. It's can you do it after you get it. But I know some people that don't have a clue what to do, but they pray and God gives them answers and the anointing kicks in and they become the best employee the company has. Not because they're the smartest, not because they're the best trained, not because they're the hardest working, but because the anointing has come with them. So the anointing that you have received from him abides in you, look at this, so that you do not need that anyone teach you. You say, well, Rich, what are you teaching us for? 
Now, I'm talking about the anointing. See, with the anointing, you don't need anybody to teach you with regard to your anointing. Because when you're, anoint when you're in your anointing, the anointing itself is your teacher. When you're in your area of anointing, the anointing itself begins to release insight to your life. And you start doing things that you couldn't do, hallelujah, on your own. Now it says here that that same anointing teaches you concerning, what does it say? All things. You know what all things means? It means all things. It's one of those not too complicated, not too hard to figure out. So if the anointing teaches you concerning all things, let me ask you this. Is there such a thing as an anointing for sales? Yeah, because it teaches you concerning all things. Is there such a thing as an anointing for marketing? Yes, of course. Is there such a thing as an anointing for computer software management? Yes, there is. Is there such a thing as an anointing for preaching? Hallelujah. We know there is. There's an anointing for all things. Now, does that mean that I have all anointings? No. It, but it does mean that there is an anointing for everything, so we are built in to need each other. I need your anointing. You need my anointing. Together, we are really anointed. Alone, I'm a little anointed. Together, we're strongly anointed. And so together, we can do anything. But what I want you to know today is that it doesn't matter what call God puts in your life, when you start walking it out, there's an anointing for that. So you say, wow, I'd love to be a preacher because there's an anointing for preaching, but God called me to be in sales. What am I going to do? Well, you're going to kick into the sales anointing doesn't matter. Now, is one anointing better than the other? Huh? Is one got higher points with God than another? No. It's just your anointing. My son, uh, my son that I was telling you about earlier that got delivered instantly from everything, I tell you, the next week I put him on church staff because I wanted to watch out for him. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to get him out there again. He'd been everywhere bad, so I put him where I could watch over him. But it soon became apparent that he wasn't anointed to be on church staff. Within two years, he was the favorite pastor at our church. Everybody loved him. He was very effective. He was doing a good job, but he was frustrated. Didn't like it. He said, Dad, I, 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 I'm grateful for the training here, but I don't fit. So, he went and uh, prayed about where he should work, and he said, I want to work in the automobile industry, but I don't want to be a car salesman. I said, how are you going to be in, how are you going to be in the car sales without selling cars? He said, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. So he said, one day I want to own my own agency, and I want to do it, and I want to skip selling cars on the lot. So I said, okay, you see what you can do. So he prayed about how he could do that, and he found another way into the automobile industry. Anybody here in the automobile industry? Anybody selling cars or whatever? So he came in through finance and insurance, F&I. So he got trained for that and then moved into the sales office from there so he could be at the desk and not have to walk people around the lot. So he's, he's wanting to do this. So he's doing it, and he gets a job, and he gets a better job, and he gets demoted, and then... The economy goes bad, and he's not earning much money. And we get this prophetic word, uh, June of this year. And the word came, it was from Bill Hammond. Bishop Hammond's really good at giving these words. Gave a word to, to me and to my wife. And then he gave a word to my son and daughter who weren't with me. So the word to my son is, you're about ready to step out of your job into your destiny. Oh, well, that's cool. So I take it to my son, and I said, uh, hey, son, I got a word for you. It's on tape. I want you to hear it. We're playing golf that day. He said, oh, just give me the word, Dad. So I said, well, here's the word. You're about ready to move out of your job into your destiny. He said, ah, oh, those prophetic words are always so generic. I wish there was something specific. I said, well, I'll go ahead and listen to the word. And, but the next day, he goes into work at his job, and the car dealership across the street calls and offers him a job at double his current pay. He said, man, i got to take it. So he resigns where he is. 
to go to work across the street. And then his friend from Denver that used to be his boss calls and says, now that you're no longer working for this agency, when I left there, they told me I could touch none of the employees there. Now that you're no longer working there, would you come work with us? And so this weekend, in fact, yesterday they showed up in Denver. My son is now the new car sales manager for the largest Honda dealership in America. And here's what he said. Never again will I discount the prophetic. You're about to move out of your job into your destiny. Because he's with a dealer now that loves young guys and trains them up and will lead them into a place where they can become owners of their own stores. So he's on track for his destiny. Now here's what happened. He has an anointing for this. When they brought him to Denver, his boss there said, Rich, I've got to send you, his name is the same as mine, he says, Rich, I've got to send you for training. I didn't bring you here because you know the job. I brought you here because of your integrity. It's another word for anointing. I brought you here not because you're the best, not because you're the best trained, but I brought you here because I know I can trust you. Now the anointing will get you to places where you're not the best employee, you're not the best qualified, you're not the best trained, but the one that they want because they see something in you that they don't have another word for, but I know what the word is, it's anointing. It means that God lands, enables you to do what you couldn't do in the natural. So my son is now living this out. He's walking into his destiny, and it's totally because of the anointing. That's why he's getting where he is. It's the anointing of God. I want to tell you, for every one of you right now, you have an anointing. In fact, the Bible says the anointing which you have. Let's read this whole thing. But the anointing which you have, read it with me, receive from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things, and is true, and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will, now it ends right there, abide in him, I believe is what it is. So the, the word of the Lord is this, the anointing is in you, abiding in you, teaching you concerning whatever it is that you need. So whenever you're in trouble, say, Lord, I need an anointing for this. Man, is there an anointing for algebra? Yeah? Yeah, I mean, even algebra. I mean, even there has to be, doesn't there, Ray? There's got to be an anointing for certain things because our natural ability will never get us there. Is there an Do you guys have to study Greek here? Oh, yeah. Is there an anointing for Greek? There has to be. <laughs> there's got to be an anointing for Greek. So, I mean, we, th there's certain things that what I can't do in my natural ability. I need the anointing of God to kick in at that level. Okay, let's go through these things. I'm just going to give you some definitions that are going to be helpful. We'll go to the next slide. Here's, here's what I believe our purpose is, to bring about change in the spiritual climate over the cities and nations in which we live and to release, empower, and equip the marketplace leaders as God speaks. I'll get to this a little bit more later. Let's go on to the next slide. Now let's go on to the next one. Also, I'll get to this later, too. One more change. All right, I just want to run through a number of definitions with you that are things that I think are important for us to get in mind. I was kicked into the workplace ministry or the, the call of God into the marketplace, whatever you want to call it, through the idea of kings and priests. Now, here's how it came to me. Our local congregation and another congregation were co-hosting a conference in my hometown, San Jose, California. And at that conference, the, the pastor of the other congregation, who's now my pastor, Dick Burnell, said uh, one night, he stood up and said, Hello, kings. And all the people said, Hello, pastor. I go in the back room after I said, Dick, what do you mean, hello, kings? Who, who are the kings that are there? And he said, Rich, you know that verse of Scripture, Revelation chapter 1, verse 6? He, the Lord, has called us kings and priests to bring dominion, et cetera, et cetera. I said, oh, wow, that's cool, because I, I, I recognize right away that's good terminology to refer to the body of Christ, kings and priests. There are certain phrases we use that are kind of put-downs, but that is kind of a lift-up. So I said to him, like any good preacher would, do you have any sermons on that topic? 
which means I'd like to preach it next Sunday at our church. And he gave me his tapes. I preached two sermons. Come on, some of you guys don't know about this yet. But one of the ways that preachers do research is listening to other preachers' sermons. Don't let them kid you about all this, uh, all 20 hours of study business. <laughs> Amen. I was with my friend, uh, a friend in Argentina, his name is Hector, and Hector had church, H Hector's church just was going wild. It had gone from 100 people to 200,000 people. They were meeting seven days a week, and they were meeting 23 hours a day. I mean, they, they let the last service out at midnight and started an all-night prayer meeting at 1 a.m. every morning. The all-night prayer meeting went till 6 a.m., and they started services every two, hour, two hours from 6 on through midnight. 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 10 o'clock, noon, 2, 4, 6, 8. Just every two hours, there was a new service going. 23 hours a day, they were meeting, and people were coming to Jesus all the time. So I'm with Hector with my good Bible church background, where we studied long and hard before we preached. And I said, how many times a day do you preach? He said, four or five. I said, every day? Uh-huh. I said, do the same message, huh? He says, no, I do a new message every time. I said, how can you do a new message every time? You mean four or five a day? Seven days a week? He said, yeah. I said, Hector, I'm preaching like twice a week studying all week to get those two messages together. How do you do it? He said, well, God knows I don't have as much time as you do. So he speaks to me faster. <laughs> then he speaks to you. Now, I got to that from doing research on sermons through listening to tapes, right? But I'm listening to my pastor's tapes on kings and priests, and I'm getting a hold of this thing. In fact, I got a hold of it so much that I haven't quit preaching it since. I preached it for a year at our congregation. Then they sent me on the road. I've been preaching this ever since, just trying to get the message that there is a call for everybody. And it needs to get out. I know it needs to get out because most people haven't thought of it, haven't considered it. It's still like revelation. It's or it's like, wow, I hadn't thought about that. Or for the business people, it's confirmation, but they needed to hear it from a pastor. So I'm using the words kings and priests instead of clergy and laity. Clergy and laity are old terminology, old wineskin terminology for the church. Laity is a Bible word which means the people, laos, the people. But clergy, I don't think you can find it in your Bible. I've searched and searched for the word clergy in the Bible. I don't think it's there. I mean, I'm, I'm willing to say maybe it's there. It's just that I can't find it, and I haven't been able to find it for six or seven years. I don't think there's any reference to clergy in the Bible. I know that the laity are there, but the laos means the people. So who are the clergy? Huh, think about that. If the laity are the people, who's the clergy? The non-people? What are the clergy? They're, they're this other class of people. But I know how we've begun to use the term. We use the term clergy to speak about the calling to full-time ministry. And here's the way it comes about. Pastor stands up and says, I'm going to give you my testimony today. I was out there working in that evil, sin sick, mean, bad, nasty world. And then God called me, and now I'm a pastor was all true, but what it sounded like was if you're still out there, you're not called. And so the people in the pew, when they got called, thought they had to leave their job, quote, to go into ministry because that's what pastor did. Now, pastor was called to preach, and they thought that calling means preaching. Calling doesn't mean preaching. The calling to preaching means preaching, but the calling to business means business. So a part of my job is to keep people from going into the preaching ministry. That's a part of my job. Because I found a lot of people who became preachers who should never have left their business. Hmm. 
And the reason they did it is because they didn't understand that it was possible to be in the center of God's will and to have his call on your life and still be working in your job. Now, if you're called to preach, you've got to preach. But if you're called to business, please don't go preach. And if you're called to preach, please don't go in business. The worst business people are made by preachers who should be preaching, and the worst preachers are made by business people who should be in business. I've known them on both sides. I've known the ones that were successful in business who should have stayed in business. I was just hearing this story just uh, uh, this week, last weekend, I was in uh, New Jersey, and there was a, a guy there that was telling this story about a horse jockey in Australia. Now, he was, the, he was uh, I think they pulled the little carts. What do you call the guys that harness racing or whatever? He was the most well-known racing driver in Australia, and he got saved. And he had tremendous impact because he's in the front page of the paper all the time. He won their, their big derby, whatever it is, the biggest thing in Australia. He won it twice. Nobody's ever won it twice. And he'd given glory to Jesus and thank God for it. Well, he got called, he thought, to leave that and to go be a preacher. So he left that, went to college, and ended up with a congregation of a hundred people that he had influence over, but he no longer had influence in the entire nation. And after his church didn't grow for a while, he thought, I believe I should go back to horseback riding or horse racing, whatever it is, because that's where my influence is. And he went back because he knew he could influence people for Jesus more there than being a preacher. Man, I've seen that in so many different ways. I've got friends who listen to a good sermon, get called of God, respond, yield their heart to Jesus, quit their job, take their family, move them to college, thinking, I've got to go into preaching. Now, some of you who had that call need to go into preaching. Some of you will never make it in preaching. But it's all right. Because there's a call for both kings and priests. So we use kings to speak to the calling outside of church ministry and priests to talk about the pastor, missionary, youth worker, worship leader, whatever church ministry might mean. And to say to you, there's a call for both. And by the way, it, the Bible says we, the body of Christ, are called as kings and priests, which means that we're both called as kings and priests. Some are more king than priest, some are more priest than king, but I don't care who you are. If you're, a, if you're a housewife, you better have some kingly anointing in you to run your household and some priestly anointing to train up your kids. If you're a business owner and you're a king in that sense, you better have some priestly anointing to know how to get God into that business. So all of us have both of those, but it's all right for you to walk with the high calling of the king upon you. So when I say we are kings and priests, it causes people to sit up, kind of throw their shoulders back a bit, lift their head higher, and say, wow, I'm not. When, whenever I heard somebody define themselves as a lay person, they would always say, I'm just a layman or only a layman. Oh, I'm not really the call of God. I'm just a layman, but. That's the, way, that's the way lay people talk in the church. I'm just a layman, but. I want to tell you, folks, there's no just or only anybody's in the kingdom of God. We are all the call of God. So when I call you a king, that's better than being called a lay person. Amen? Kind of throw your shoulders back. I'm a king. By the way, ladies, I call you kings as well. So just tell the person next to you, hey, I'm a king. I'm a king. Now, I don't recommend you go tell people at work that on Monday. Don't go to your job this afternoon and say, uh, by the way, <laughs> I just learned this. You may not know it, but I am a king. Don't even go there. You can know it in your own hearts. Kind of like David knew he was king long before he was on the throne, and he had to just hide it there. That's where you are. You're kings, but not yet reigning on the throne. And I say, ladies, I call you kings as well. I don't call you queens. I don't call you kingettes. You're kings. Kings, and you say, but, but I'm a woman. Well, think of it this way. I'm a man, and I'm the bride. <laughs> See? So if I can be a bride and be happy, then you can be kings and be happy. Because in Jesus, there's neither male nor female. I mean, God wipes all that out. 
So in these last days, in the new church, in the new paradigm, we're not worried. Oh, I, am I okay here at, at this school to talk about this? We don't worry about men and women. It's okay, women and men. I mean, I just want to make sure that this is where I'm coming from, folks. I believe the next move of God. Here's what I believe. The next move of God will be led by a business person more likely than a pastor. I think God will surprise us. And I believe that the next great move of God, led by a business person, will more likely than not be a woman business person. It's my belief. I believe that God is raising up women this day in business. He's going to use, I mean, just, where are all the guys saying preach it? It's all the women that are saying preach it. But I, I'm with you. I'm going to preach it because I believe it. I mean, Tamara Lowe. Do you remember Tamara from the, I mean, Tamara is going to be used by God. I, I've, been, I've been introducing the guys, at least in conversation, to another woman that I believe God is going to use named Linda Reels Brook. And this, this gal is one of the most articulate communicators of the Bible that I've ever, ever heard and very, very successful in business. And I think God is just going to use somebody like that to spark the next revival. And so I'm watching and saying everybody in the body of Christ needs to get ready because the revival could break out where you work at any given moment. You could be the one that it happens through. It doesn't have to happen in the church during a sermon. It can happen while you're at work, while you're standing at the water cooler, while you're praying, when the miracle comes, when God touches there. It can happen right there at work. Hey, think of it. People flying into Pensacola to go to the revival. Oh, really? What's church? Oh, no, it's not out of church. It's down where I work. And every Tuesday, God shows up. The anointing kicks in. People get healed. Everybody gets saved. People from all over the world are coming to the revival at work. Are we stretching this thing too far? It's the vision I've got, folks. It's the one I've got. I mean, I believe it. the first vision I had was of Nordstrom's department store. Do you know what Nordstrom's is? Nordstrom's a great department store. and We have them out in California. They have a big grand piano there, and the lady or man playing the piano. I, my vision was of this woman playing the piano, and she started playing church tunes, and people started getting saved. And the manager comes down to stop it and gets healed as he steps up to the piano. This is just my, my vision, is the revival breaks out at Nordstrom, and people start coming into town to go to the Nordstrom revival. <laughs> I can get a lot of amens from women on that one, too. They, they love the idea of a revival at Nordstrom's. It's just somehow or another, these two things sound good. Oh, yeah. Hey, honey, where are you going? Go to Nordstrom. No, you can't. No, it's the revival, dear. It's like, I'm not shopping honest. I'm just going to go get in the presence of Jesus. Buy a couple pair of shoes, and, but get in the presence of Jesus. So clergy and laity, I think that's old language. Kings and priests is new language. Now, I'm not using kings and priests as often anymore because I found that when, when I do it, there's an, a mindset stuck with it. And the mindset came some, from, from some priests that were using it, and they said this. Priests have the vision. Kings bring the provision. Now, that's kind of one of those amen type statements, but it's a put down to business people. Business people have more than money to bring to the table in the kingdom of God. They have strategy, they have creative ideas, they have ministry gifts. So when we say priests have the vision, kings bring the provision, what we're saying is that we as the pastors have got all the ministry stuff, just give us your money to carry out our vision. As a pastor, my job is to help you as a business person to fulfill your vision out there at work. That's what God called me as a pastor to train you, to equip you to do the work of ministry. Read your Bible, guys. It doesn't say that the ministry is to do ministry. The ministry is to train, the pastor is to train the business people for ministry. Where does ministry happen? Out amongst the people. So if we're going to get into God's way of doing it, what we've called ministry isn't ministry, but it's equipping for ministry. What we've called the laity is really where ministry is to happen. That's the reality in this day. So we go to this phrase, ministry versus full-time ministry. There's no such thing as part-time ministry. You're either in it all the time or you're not. So start acting like it. You're in full-time ministry. 
Now, we use ordination, recognition, or empowering, whatever phrase you want to put on it. We think we need to recognize the people that are called by God to serve him out in the marketplace. I'll get to a little bit more of that later. The church is, this is a language that we're trying to get together on right now, folks, and we're struggling with it. Because the reality is we know this building, we call it the church, but we know it's not the church. We know that we are the church, yet we know that when we come here, we call ourselves the church. So we're trying to get some terminology that works. And here's what we're kind of trying out on the body of Christ right now. The nuclear church and the extended church. The nuclear church, like your nuclear family, mom and dad, kids, aunts and uncles, nuclear family. Extended family is your bigger family. So you have a family reunion. That's with all of your cousins. The nuclear families and brothers and sisters. So the nuclear family is your local congregation, has a pastor, a building, a set of programs. But the extended church is the ones you meet with that don't go to your local congregation. They're the ones that are all over the place. Does that work? I don't know. Is that helpful or not? Well, I mean, we're, st we're still really honestly working on this thing, trying to get some terminology that matches, because I think it's confusing to the world. When we say to them, that's the church I go to, they say, oh, that's your church? Well, that's really not the church. It's just the building the church meets in. I don't think they understand what we mean because they think that's the church. So to them, church is something separate from and different from the normal flow of life. Church is not something that you are. Church is a place that you go. So when you try to impact the world and bring church to them, they don't want church brought to them. They want to go to church, but really they don't want to go to church. They want the choice to not go to church because they think it's something separate from them. So somehow or another, we've got to get ourselves to the place where we can use language that doesn't confuse the world because quite honestly, it confuses me. See, I know this is the church, but I know it's not the church. Is that a confusing thing or what? I know that when I come here, I've gone to church, but I know I can't go to church because I am the church. So I'm trying to get, our, get us to think at a level that we can impact our world by being the church. So we're trying to talk about one kind of church, nuclear church versus extended church. The extended church meets everywhere where you are. So at your company, there should be a corporate church. You say, what's corporate church? Well, that's me while I'm at work. That's all that is. I don't have to establish, I don't need bylaws, I don't need anything, I don't need a program. It's me at work, corporate church. Nuclear church is when I go to my local congregation. Now you'll find me trying to use, and I'm not good at this because I've got too, much, too many years doing the wrong way, trying to use the word congregation as opposed to church when I talk about where I've ministered. I talk about my local congregation as opposed to my church because I'm trying to change my thinking to match my life. You see, if we think that the building and the programs and the pastor's group, his flock, is the church, then if we're called to ministry, all we can do is go work in the church. But if we recognize that the church is the broader body of Christ, then I can be in ministry wherever I am because that's the church. So unless I can get my mind to think broader, I'll never see that as ministry. I'll, think, I'll still think that only when I go to church is ministry. So I've got to get myself to think broader. I've got to get you to think broader. We need to get the school, the, the church structure to think broader. And I've decided we're not going to get rid of the word church. I don't want to get rid of the word church. But we're not going to stop using it for our local assembly either. I've figured that out. I tried for two or three years. You can't win that battle. So now we're just trying to use nuclear church, extended church, to get us thinking about the two different manifestations of church. So at least wise, we can think that we understand the church as it is today. So where is the church right now in Pensacola? Yeah, it's wherever we happen to be. So it's here right now because we're here, but it's in the car when we get in the car. It's at the restaurant when we get there. It's at home when we get there. It's in the shopping mall when we go there. And it's on our job when we get there. So when I go to work, the church is there. The church is present there. So where was the church when the terrorists attacked the World Trade Center? Where was the church? Was the church present there in the World Trade Center? 
Was the church there on the 98th floor? Yeah. Did the church go to work right then? Absolutely. I believe the church saved a lot of people that afternoon or that morning in the few minutes between the attack and the crumbling of the building. I believe the church kicked in at that moment. Remember a few years ago, there was an Alaska Airlines jet that crashed out of the coast of California. Do you remember this? That was eight or ten years ago. On that plane was a pastor and his wife. They had about ten minutes warning that they knew they were going down. And this pastor's wife took the microphone from the flight attendant and led that plane to Jesus. Uh, you, could, you could hear it on the recorder in the background when they picked it up. The church kicked in on that airplane. And everybody, let me tell you something. If you want to talk about an audience that's ready to receive the Lord, hey, folks, in eight minutes we're going down. Anybody want to receive Jesus? You now have six minutes. I mean, it's like they didn't know how long they had. But I tell you what, this, this girl, and I know her, I know, I know this pastor and I know this, this woman, Linda was strong in any given situation, but on that airplane, she really kicked into her anointing. It's because the church was present on that airplane. You want to be ready to be the church wherever you are. So, you know, I spent a lot of time on airplanes, and I'll tell you, when I get on an airplane, that's the church. I worship, I worshiped on Continental Airlines yesterday because I flew Continental Airlines from San Jose to here. I worshiped on American Airlines on Sunday because I flew from New Jersey to San Jose on American Airlines. When I get on that airplane, that's the church because I'm the church. Therefore, that becomes church. So when I go there, I know the presence of God is there. I know there's an anointing there. I, I'm expecting to sit next to somebody that God is going to either let me study or kick into a discussion with them. <laughs> In fact, I know how to get the discussion going. I also know how to shut it up. If, if I don't want to talk to them, they're sitting next to me. They say, what do you do? I say, I'm a pastor. They're just quiet right then. They don't talk to me anymore. Oh, you're a pastor. They might say what kind of church, but usually we're done. Now, if I really don't want to talk, I say, I'm a missionary. For sure, we're done at that point. They, boom. <laughs> no, no conversation. So when I want to talk to them, I say, uh, they say, what do you do? I say, I'm a business consultant. Oh, really? What kind of business do you consult? I said, I do conferences and motivational speaking. Oh, yeah, what kind of? I said, well, mostly for Christians. Huh? Yeah, I'm trying to get Christians to use their Christianity in the marketplace. And what do you mean? I said, well, try to match your faith with your work life. Wow, that's sure neat, it isn't. Man, I could have a whole conversation. Just, I've found that saying I'm a businessman opens more doors for me to talk about Jesus than saying I'm a pastor. You'd think, hey, I'm a pastor. Everybody say, oh, really, can I get saved? But they don't all say that. They say, oh, really, can I change seats? It's, it's more likely. They know I'm going to preach at them, hold them captive there. They think, they, all of a sudden, they're trying to get out. Oh, you know, I'm really tired. I think I'll take a nap. But, because, but when I'm a business person, I just surprise them and come in with this message about Jesus. Because it's in me. It's not based on what I do. It's who I am. Amen. Let's go to the next page. I'm trying to get you to think church in a little bit broader way. Are you doing okay on this? Are you changing your thinking? You know, we gotta, if we don't change the way we think, we won't change the way we talk. We don't change the way we talk. We won't change the way we act. We don't change the way we act. We're going to keep doing the same things that we've been doing. And the things we've been doing are not saving our cities. So we've got to change the way we think to get the rest of it going. Okay, now I've been through most of this, but let me just say it to you again. The call of God is for all of us, the purpose of the call is to change your city. The purpose of the call is to bring God's presence in to change the atmosphere over your city. Reaching your city and transformation of your city is really why God calls you to a place. I ran into one pastor. I said, so how large is your congregation? He said, 153,000. I said, wow, it's large. He said, yeah, only about 200 come to church on Sunday, but 
153,000, that's the population of my city, that's my congregation, that's who I'm going for. He says, in our congregation we have prostitutes, we have drug addicts, we have the mafia, we have them all. They're all a part of my congregation because that's where God has called me, 153,000 people, that's who I'm going to reach. See, his mindset isn't grow the church, his mindset is reach my city. Think bigger than your local congregation, think reach the city. Reach the city. Think your city. Think your town, city. Think your state. I, I love people who think beyond even their city. Some people think Florida. We're going to get Florida for Jesus. And so they're involved in statewide initiatives. Some people think nationwide. A handful of people, and most of my men are from South Africa, think continent-wide. South Africans think the whole continent of Africa. Are you from South Africa? I mean, it, the South Africans always surprise me. City reaching and nation reaching are not enough for a South Africa. They want the continent of Africa. We're going for it all. Now, so I love to get down to South Africa because they've got the biggest faith of anybody I've ever met. They think the whole continent is above us and we're going to reach them all. We're going to impact them. So think bigger than you've been thinking. Your call to ministry is not just a call to a small group of people that you're going to influence. It is to get that group of people out there to influence the city. So can you think bigger than you've been thinking? Think in hundreds, not tens. Think in thousands, not hundreds. Finally, get to the place where you can think in millions so that you can start thinking. You say, is it possible? When I went to Afghanistan, the, my call to Afghanistan comes from a doctor and his wife who were called by God to go to Afghanistan back in the year 2001. We're still fighting the Taliban in 2001. When he got to Afghanistan, it wasn't even legal to get into the country. But God had told him to go there, so he got as far as he could, Karachi, Pakistan, caught a flight into Afghanistan with a bunch of guys that were supplying fuel for the American troops that were there. He got a ride on one of those planes, just got out at the airport in Kabul, took a taxi to a, the only hotel that was operating, and just stayed there because God told him to be there. When he and his wife heard me speak in the last weekend of July this year, she came to me and said, the message you preached just swept millions of Muslims into the kingdom of God. I said, what? She said, what impacted my life? What you said to me about business as ministry has given me a platform to sweep millions of Muslims into the body of Christ. If you will come, we'll bring millions more. Will you come to Afghanistan? Now, how can you say no to something like that? I mean, she's not thinking a few people. She's thinking millions. Now, was that just a faith statement? Or did she really believe it? Well, I guess if it's, if it's a faith statement, she really believe it, right? So we're starting now to reach the Muslim world through business. Let me tell you another Afghanistan story. These are kind of fun little stories. I'm in Afghanistan teaching students from the University of Kabul. Now, Kabul University is uh, it's known as an oasis in Kabul. The city has been blown apart. 25 years of war. Half the buildings are destroyed. The electricity in our house where we stayed operated three hours a day. That's because that's all the longer we could run the generator. No running water. I mean, it's like tough existence there. To shower in the morning, you go heat your water and pour it over your head, soap up and pour some more over to rinse yourself. That's it. No showers, no hot bath. Just so we're teaching these students. Now, at Kabul University, the girls' dormitory has been destroyed by bombs. They're trying to rebuild it, but it's not there yet. The boys' dormitory holds 800 men, and there are 2,700 guys living there. It's way beyond its capacity, and it has no electricity and has no running water. It's a pretty tough existence. I mean, think about how tough you have it here. So we're teaching these guys, because there is no business school at Kabul University. They've got 14 colleges, but no business school. So the only training they're going to get in business is what we're giving them. So when I was there, I was the best in town. <laughs> it's just really kind of scary, except I had the anointing, so it was, it was good. 
So I'm training them, and we're sitting in this room, and we've got tables lined up. I'm sitting at the head of the table. People are both sides of the table. It's full, and then a few people scattered around the back. We have maybe 20 or 30 people in the room. And in walk three guys halfway through. Now, the three guys that walked in were all long flowing robes, big long beards, these little hats on their head. I mean, Osama bin Laden lookalikes, every one of them. And they walked in, and there's no joy in their life, so there were no smiles on their faces. And they walked in and looked at the situation that all the chairs were taken. I'm sitting at the very front. All the chairs are taken. There's a few chairs in the back. Now, our normal thing would be to go sit in one of those chairs. All three of these guys went back, picked up one of those chairs, and carried it up and sat right beside me. One on this side, two on this side. And I'm thinking, I've just been set up by the Taliban or somebody. <laughs> who are these guys? Now, who were they? Hungry, young, Muslim businessmen desiring to be taught how to start a business. They're the ones that are writing down 10 rules for business from a holy book. I mean, blow you away. And my, I took it upon myself as one of my goals to get these guys to smile. Now, I figure, how can you get joy at work if you can't have joy in a training session? Man, I'm working on these guys. I'm, I've said, okay, repeat after me. And everybody repeated after me, but one of these guys says, sir. Yes, I said, you didn't repeat. <laughs> and I'm thinking, Rich, you're going to get your head cut off if you just don't be quiet. He said, oh, I'm sorry. And he repeated. Then he, just, then he started laughing. I said, good. I figured I better quit right here because I just want to get these guys to laughing. Now, let me tell you, if you go to a place like that as a preacher, you have nothing to say. But if you go with the anointing of God to train them in business techniques, they will sit and learn at your feet and write down whatever you tell them to write down. I said, you know, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. Oh, say that again. They write it down. <laughs> it's written in a holy book. God opposes the proud, gives grace to the humble. We've got to walk in this thing with humility. Okay, good. That's good. We've got to get rid of our pride. I mean, these guys don't have pride. They just... If they don't like you, maybe they're going to blow you up. <laughs> but they want us to teach them. Ministry is what it's all about. Reaching cities and nations is what God has called us to. Revival and transformation is where we're going. The anointing, I just talked to you about that. You have an anointing. There is an anointing for business. Hallelujah. Now, let me talk to you about the fivefold ministry in the marketplace. The fivefold ministry, the apostle prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher out of Ephesians 4 was given to the body of Christ for the equipping of saints for the work of ministry. I want to say to you today, I step out a little bit further here, the fivefold is not just for church structure. There are pastors in the marketplace. There are apostles in the marketplace. There are prophets in the marketplace. There are evangelists and teachers in the marketplace. You can have apostolic anointing and serve God in business. Somebody say amen. This is okay. Apostolic anointing doesn't mean that you become a church planner and lead a mission organization or a group of churches. Apostolic anointing may mean that you go to work as an entrepreneur in business and you plant businesses with the mindset of changing the city and the world. I was just this weekend with a man from London, England, whose name is Julian Watts. Julian is an apostle to the marketplace. Julian was successful with a consulting firm, a big one, one of the, the big five of the whole world, K, C, M, B, what is it? Uh, somebody knows the real initials of that thing. He was a partner with this big consulting firm, very successful. God called him out of that to start his own business, a business-to-business, -business, B2B connection worldwide. Every, every company in the world, every product that you needed could be obtained through his business. Now, he started it with a kingdom mindset. When he started his business, he was offered $50 million for it. That was before the dot-com crash back in 2000. No, thank you. I don't want your $50 million. God told me to start this business. Then the dot-com crash came, and everything falls apart. He's offered $37 million for his company by an Australian company. Now, at this point, 
you're thinking, Julian, take the money. Your company, which used to be worth 50 million, is worth nothing today. They'll give you 37 million. He said, no, thank you, because this is a kingdom business. It got down to the place where he could pay no one salaries. Every employee had to let him go. He couldn't pay himself. He told me this week, I've been 48 months now without a salary. Every single month, God has had to provide. Miraculously, my house payment, my car payment, my children's education, clothes, everything, every single month. He said, next month, this is this weekend, next month will be the first time I've been able to draw a salary in 48 months. But his business has taken off suddenly. And what he did was he gave it away. See, if you want to own a part of this business in America, you could buy the franchise. Or in any nation of the world, it would be in every nation of the world and in all 50 states of America. So there'd be like 250, 275 franchises. But he's given it to the nation of Israel. In Israel, it's free. They went to Israel last year and said, in Israel, before 9-11, 2001, there were four or 500 business trips into Israel to set up joint ventures with Israeli business. After that, they all dropped. Nobody's going to Israel for business. The first group that went was a consortium of Christian organizations, six or seven companies, IEEC, International Christian Chamber of Commerce, the Fellowship of Christian Companies Incorporated, six or seven international Christian businesses went there, spent two days with the four or five hundred Christian businessmen from around the world at tables meeting with over, I think it was over 5,000 Israeli business people they connected together. All of that's done through Julian's company, which he's given to Israel free. When he did it, it started taking off. He's an apostle in the marketplace. I tell you, this guy is so good. He is going to impact Israel for Jesus. And they know why he's there. He tells them, we're a Christian company, and we've come to bless the nation of Israel. And what we're going to do is, if you want to be a part of this, I want you to know, in advance, Israel, I'm giving this to you, but 10% of the profits of your company here, which I've given you, 10% of the profits will go to uh, propagate my purposes, which is spreading the love of Jesus around the world. They said, no problem. We'd be glad to do it because they need business. Business connections are what's needed. When I met Julian, God gave me a picture and uh, showed me how he is going to be used to connect the Muslim and the, is the Jewish world. Those two worlds are at war, and they will not get peace through religious understanding, period. They won't get peace through peace treaties that are written. Not going to happen. They won't get peace treaties through education. We've been trying this since Isaac and Ishmael. I believe peace will come through business connections. As they need each other, they will operate in a conjunctive way that brings the glory of God into both of them. And I think it's why Julian and I are connected, him for the Jewish world, me for the Muslim world. See, I, I feel more called to the Jewish world. I've never been called to the Muslim world. But suddenly this business thing has grabbed a hold and given me a heart for the Muslim people. So I, right after Afghanistan, I was in Indonesia. The next week, I'm in Indonesia, the largest Muslim nation in the world. Did you know that? fourth largest nation in the world, the largest Muslim population in the world is in Indonesia. My conference there, they had three weeks notice that I was coming because I was on my way to Thailand. Somebody said, why don't you stop in Indonesia? Three weeks notice. We sold it out at 1,100 people with three weeks notice on a Monday, the worst day in the world to get business people to give up a day of work and go to a conference. There's a hunger in this part of the world for business and ministry. It's just happening right now. God is raising up this whole apostolic in the marketplace thing. I met a man from Atlanta, Georgia. He said, Rich, all the businesses I've started, I've started with a fivefold in mind. Now, he was young. I figured he's like mid-30s, maybe 40 at the most. I said, all the businesses? He said, I've started a bunch. He said, I always start with me, the apostle. I have the vision. I have the apostolic view. I can see it all. The first person I hire... Every time I hire the president, I hire a pastor. 
hire someone with a pastoral gift to be president because president of the company is like pastor of a church. He's got to see every division. He's got to care for all the people. He's got to make sure it all happens. So president, pastor. He said, the next one I hire is evangelist. Evangelist heads my sales department. Next one I hire is teacher. They had my training department. The next one I hire is a prophet. I put him in every division because we want to be able to see what God is saying about tomorrow. My first five employees, every company, apostle, pastor, evangelist, teacher, prophet. He said, that's why I always start my company, with a five-fold ministry in mind. Think outside the box, guys. Think outside local church. Think apostles in the marketplace. Think prophet in the marketplace. Think of the way God worked in the Old Testament. Most of the prophets, all except two of the prophets of the Old Testament, were businessmen. Did you know that? Think about it. Hosea, Amos. Amos was a farmer dude. You know, they were all businessmen. Moses was a businessman, worked for 40 years in his father-in-law's fields. I mean, th these guys are business people and prophets. <laughs> Somebody one time said to me, Moses wasn't a businessman, he was a prophet. I said, well, you know, it's possible to be both. But if you think that prophets have to be pastors, then they can't be both. But if you realize business people, so the five-fold ministry of the apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher operate in the body of Christ, operate everywhere. Amen? Are you still with me? Okay, we're going to end at uh, 1235 today. I'm giving you 25 minutes off so that you'll be here on time tomorrow, fresh and ready to go for what I'm going to teach you in the morning. How to win friends at a school. Let them out early. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. So, Tomorrow morning, what time, what time do we start tomorrow? 8 o'clock. We start at 8 a.m. tomorrow morning. So we're going to be here ready to go. Ward, you take it from here. Thank you very much. Stand your attention before we go. You know, God has called every one of us here to be RSM for a purpose. This morning was, a, a, I think, a critical time for all of us, just for the opportunity to to press into God to see our destiny one step further. Maybe some are completely unlocked. Even in my own life, I cried out to God today. Two weeks ago, Mr. Ard and I, we went with a businessman to Kamchatka, Russia, in the middle of nowhere, on the peninsula of Russia, the very end of Russia. And it took us by private jet six hours to get there or seven hours from California it took us six hours to get back then it took us 15 hours to get from there back to Pensacola because we had a rough it on the commercial airlines but let me tell you what this businessman did he took us to Kamchatka Russia in the middle of nowhere and one of the biggest businesses in that in area north of where we were was herding reindeers and uh, they were featured a little while ago in charisma where this guy took a russian snowmobile and took it to, to bring food to those that were dying but he arrived we arrived in kamchatka russia on a 40 million dollar plane on a runway that was bumpy with potholes and I'm sure that his schedule was real busy, but he left and dropped everything to go to Russia to check on a work that he's helping to finance, to encourage the believers there, and to give them some more money. He's anointed for the kingdom of God's business. Well, you've all been called here for your own purpose. I don't know what it is. I want to make sure that you don't think we're trying to say to you today that it's not to become a pastor or an evangelist because that's the calling of BRSM, to raise up men of God. But let me tell you what that man of God needed more than anything else. He needed an anointed pastor or chaplain or woman or man of God that could help him because he didn't know what to do. He had been given gifts and talents of God to use them. So he asked me for help and I asked Mr. Hart for help. <laughs> And we work together with all of our anointing, like Mr. Marshall is saying. But I tell you, today was an awesome session. 
And tonight, if you can come back, we encourage you to be here tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock. But don't leave without taking this message with you in your heart today. I think God's done something special here. Do you believe that? Yeah. Go with the anointing of God.